artificial intelligence is a very broad term that just means the ability for a software program or a machine to complete a task that a human would normally do. Um, so because it's such a broad term, artificial intelligence has actually been around for a really long time, and we've had it in our software um, and in our computer programs and in our, in our robots for a really long time. Um, the reason why we talk more about it now is that there's a new type of AI. Um, and so we talk about two different types of AI. One is rules-based and one is data-based. And in the same way that sometimes we have rules for healthcare, like um, after you hit a certain temperature um, on your thermometer, you have a fever. That's a rule. And you can say, okay, you've hit this temperature on your thermometer. Yes, you have a fever. No, you don't have a fever. But things like if you're looking at an image of a tumor on an x-ray or on an MRI or a CT, um, there's a lot of different things you're looking at and you're trying to figure it out and, you're, and basically you, you start using your judgment. Um, and that's, you get your judgment by, what, by looking at a whole bunch of different images um, and being given some loose rules around that. Um, but eventually you figure it out for yourself. So AI is being incorporated into healthcare in several different ways. Um, one of which is actually in a lot of administrative back-end type tasks that we don't, as patients, see that often. But things around scheduling, things around trying to understand billing, um, being able to automate a lot of those processes to be able to uh, make that, those type of processes much more efficient and move faster. Um, they also use those type of processes to detect fraud. Um, another way that it's, you're increasingly seeing AI is actually in the clinical decision support space. And so it's being integrated into software that gives your doctor recommendations as to diagnosis or treatment plans, or um, if you're given a CT, the CT may automatically circle certain areas of interest and say, we think these might be problematic areas, take a, take a closer look at those areas. Um, and AI is also being used um, more frequently to help either treat uh, either either patients themselves or um, sort of frontline healthcare workers to be able to help triage problems and say, um, this is a little bit beyond my experience, but I can put some of these things into an, an, an AI system and it will tell me what a doctor would probably say. And so I can then say, tell patients, this is actually nothing, probably nothing to worry about. You don't have to go to the hospital. Um, versus, yes, actually, this probably is pretty serious and you should go. Whereas um, in any other situation, I might be much more conservative and always go. And so these type of systems really help triage patients and, and help them avoid unnecessary visits, which also um, decreases the, um, the work burden in, in those hospitals, which are often very crowded. So there are a couple of questions that I think that leaders in Latin America should be thinking about as this, these types of software are coming into their countries. And the first of which is, how, how well is this software going to actually work in my country? And so if we're talking about a machine learning algorithm, where was that data, where, where was the data it was trained on collected? Was it in that country or was it not? And this is really an important point because when you're talking about data, it can really differ an enormous amount depending on where it was collected. And that means from doctor to doctor, from hospital to hospital, from region to region. Data can vary in enormous amounts. And so if the data wasn't actually collected in your country and in various points in your country, to develop the algorithm in the first place, has at least been has it at least been tested in those in, in those areas to make sure that it will work. And one of the important reasons why you want to think about this is that you don't want to worsen health disparities. And so, if the country if the data was all collected in a very um, wealthy hospital area, then it might not work in some of the under as well. These software products may not work as well in some of these underserved areas. And this is a key point because I think one of the one of the uh, largest benefits that this software AI, AI software can provide is it can add access to healthcare in areas where it's not traditionally as available. But you need to make sure that it's going to work in those areas. Is the data digitized? Do they have the capabilities to be able to um, either send the data to a cloud to run through the algorithm, or can the algorithm actually be uh, put onto a tablet and, and, and brought to to those healthcare centers? And so, understanding whether that data, whether the data that's collected at the centers where you really think that this is going to have provide the most benefit, that the software will work in those areas, and that also they have the ability to actually run that software. It's really going to be a critical question. You also want to think about how you evaluate the risk of the software. And one of the big components of that is going to be things like explainability. And so we talked about these black box algorithms. We don't understand exactly what the software is doing. And in some cases, that might be okay. If you've tested the performance and it's a fairly low risk product, Maybe it's okay that you don't quite understand exactly how it's working. 
but in a higher risk situation or when you're making decisions that are irreversible or if you're making decisions that may take away resources from someone um, and, and that they would normally have the ability to appeal it, but because the software program doesn't provide an explanation as to why it said no, there's nothing really to appeal. And so those, these are questions where we really want to understand when do we need explainability and when may, when, when, when may the country decide in these particular products it's, it's, it's okay, the benefit risk ratio is all right. The other question you want to ask is, has these products actually shown that they can increase value? And so by that I mean, do they actually improve outcomes in the real world or do they lower costs in the real world? Um, and I think that those type of, that type of testing and that type of, that type of, um, those type of results are really something you want to see before you start implementing things on a larger scale. Another question that these leaders might want to ask is how is the workforce going to react to these products coming in? And do these products actually fit into the normal workflow? Um, and this is important because if you, if, if, if a doctor or a healthcare, frontline healthcare worker really needs to completely change how they do healthcare to make these products work, that's going to be a very big change for them to make. Uh, and it's going to be difficult for them to do that. It's going to be a longer training process. And it's, if these products are effective enough, then potentially that's worth it. But if there's just a small improvement, that's going to be a harder case to make, to for, make for them. The other thing you want to understand is what's actually going to make them change their mind? And so this software might give you a recommendation that's correct. But if the, so if the provider themselves don't actually, it doesn't give enough information to the provider to make them change their mind from what they would normally think, they can decide not to tell the patient what that says. Um, and so you've actually added no, you've added an expense because you've put in this software, but you actually have added no value because the only time they, they, they use the software's advice is when they already agree with it.